So I work for the U.S. government, so I first need to give you my disclaimer. This is my own research. This is not the policy of the U.S. government. Uh, it's a personal uh, view. Okay. Now, uh, on to real stuff. Uh, I am one of those people that Jim referred to as someone who's done a review. So I've done a review of the evidence on um, impact evaluations or other evaluation research, uh, experimental or quasi-experimental research on uh, youth employment programs. Uh, and so, um, uh, but I, when I did mine, first of all, I tried to focus on low and lower middle income countries, other, other reviews. Uh, for example, one that drives me nuts is a meta analysis that included France, Germany, and Malawi. I didn't do that. Um, so, because I think the economies are too different and the programs themselves are also very different. Um, and I uh, frame mine within the context of structural transformation. So, as Jim has already said, um, you know, the opportunities depend upon the employment structure. Um, and, uh, w and I think the problem is an employment problem. As a friend of mine who works in the Middle East says, um, youth need jobs, but so do their parents. Uh, it's an employment problem. And if your economy is only, this is, uh, these are average statistics from the ILO. If your economy is only uh, generating enough employment so that 19% of all people who are employed can work in any kind of a wage job, formal or informal, um, the opportunities aren't going to be very good for anybody, youth or non-youth. So uh, I would argue that if what, what I'm trying to argue in this paper is if you focus your policy just on trying to get these jobs for youth, well, first of all, not all youth are going to get them anyway. So it's really a question of which youth get them. And maybe it's also a question of whether they go to youth or adults. And that if you stop trying to improve the earnings of the people in this sector, which include agriculture as well as the informal sector that uh, Daniel show, uh, showed you, um, then you have left out a large share of the population. So while I agree with Jim that countries should try to move their economies over here, and, um, and by the way, why... Why is this gray rectangle so low in many countries? Well, if you think about the least, least, least developed thing, region, country, island, whatever, what is it? Everybody sits at home and makes everything they need. They grow it, they make it, whatever. They're, then uh, what is a rich country? A rich country does all of that production in firms because it specializes, because specialization uh, raises productivity and makes you uh, richer. And um, so that's really uh, what development is about. It's about more modern firms that produce with more capital and better technology, higher value things that it can sell and that people buy and, you know, whatever, it produces uh, all of these jobs. Uh, now, all of these jobs aren't good, and we can talk about labor rights and all those other things, but, you know, uh, you can't get here without getting more firms, a lot, a lot, a lot more firms. And that means, and that tends to make you richer. So it's all about, I, it's, I think the framing, I'm on uh, Jim's page, that it's about the economy, stupid, as a famous, rather bald, um, democratic political consultant once said some time ago in the U.S. Um, okay, so now, just how do I frame it? Uh, the way I frame it is if you took a course in economics and they would tell you that in the labor market there is demand, uh, uh, there is supply, and there is demand, and um, as wages increase, demand goes down, and as wages increase, supply goes up, and you get an equilibrium, and that's your wage rate, and that's your employment and everybody who wants a higher wage doesn't work. And then they would tell you that if the supply increases, uh, and this is sort of like an entry level labor market where everybody's pretty much the same, if the supply increases, 
or you can think of the supply increase faster than demand. Um, you get a lot of people entering the labor market, but there's a financial crisis, so no jobs are being created, whatever. Then if the wage rate doesn't fall, employment doesn't increase. So if the wage rate stays here, you know, but you're over here, all of these people in this group are uh, unemployed, right? And it, uh, but if the wage rate falls, then you get all of these people employed. And for these people, tough luck, you have too high of a wage aspiration. Um, OK, well, that's not really how life works, but especially not in a developing country, because you know, for various reasons, there's a floor under the wage rate. In Africa, there tends to be a floor. You could think of that as a minimum wage, but you don't it, have to think of it as a minimum wage. You can just think of it as this is the cost of living and going to work in a city, which is where most of the firms are. And you're not going to go to work to get on the get dressed and get on the bus and go to work if you're not making enough money to pay for the clothes and the housing and the bus fare and some food for your family, right? You'll just grow stuff or you're, you'll sell stuff like uh, Danielle's friends do or whatever. So there's a there's an there's a floor under the wage rate. So that means if this is the demand curve, this many people are hired. But what you have is a whole lot more people who are qualified for this job. All of these people probably graduated secondary school. And they all want this job. Even if it's not the best job, they want it. And so basically, the firm doesn't care because it's an entry level job. So they hire this quantity. And these people don't get the job, even though they look and are as qualified as these people, right? And so what do these people do? They become Danielle's friends or Luke's friends. They either farm or they're informal traders, or they do a mix of things, right? Now, what if I am a donor? And I do a youth employment program. And that trains people, uh, gives them maybe uh, more, it, it increases the number of people who are secondary graduates, increases their ability to look for a job, gives them a bus fare to go to the urban area. Whatever it is I do, uh, that's what I do. I give them some training or something. Something I help them, I change their characteristics in some way that moves this supply curve out. Well, what happens? Well, we just have now B and C who qualify for the job, want the job, and don't get the job. And maybe what I've done is I've taken some people who are in A who are not youth, and I bounced them over to B and C, and I've taken some youth and bounced them over to A. I've just made a substitution about who gets a job. I didn't increase any more jobs through my training program, my youth employment program, I called it, right? And so that's the problem with the framing of it's a youth problem, is that you try to change the characteristics of youth, and it doesn't do any good in terms of the economy and more jobs. You just change who gets the jobs. And since you don't know who usually, usually you don't know who didn't get the job, you don't know who you substituted for. Maybe you substituted a rich youth for a poor person supporting 18 people. Or maybe you didn't. We don't know. Maybe you substituted a, a, a young woman for a young man. Maybe that's what you want to do, because you think young women are more deserving. Uh, when I was a young woman, I probably thought I was more deserving. But uh, you know, you're, you have to understand you're redistributing, and you have to understand that at a cost per job of, say, 1500 or 2000 that's a pretty expensive redistribution. OK, so what I focus on is what's your theory of change? And you really need to, you should invest in training if there are entry-level vacancies that exist and don't get filled. So we can think about an industry that's expanding. It can't hire enough workers. It's doing the training itself. It can't train people fast enough. Or there's a collective action problem, so it doesn't want to do the training and then have all the workers poached. I mean, that's sort of the justification for a, a, investing in, say, IT skills in Africa. Certainly, the demand for skills in that area is increasing. Uh, it might be the just, there, there are probably other sectors. It's probably a justification for investing in construction skills. There seems always to be a shortage of skilled uh, tradespeople in Africa. So there may be, there are areas where there may be a justification for doing it, but most job training programs don't even do that assessment. 
and don't even look at this question. Now, but if your problem is there aren't enough jobs, then you have to uh, invest in what I call the business climate. And you have to increase the demand for labor, all labor, and especially entry-level labor, because that's what youth is. Okay, I'm putting aside, I admit that I'm putting aside the earnings question and the labor rights question. I think all of those are important for, but not just for youth. They're important for everybody. This, again, is an employment problem. Okay, so now I surveyed. With this framing, uh, I'm going to show you the results of my surveys of all the research and how it falls together. And um, with that framing, you won't be surprised about my results. Okay, so... This is a result of supply-side interventions um, for wage jobs. And, um, you know, the ones in red didn't work at all. The, uh, the ones in blue worked a little bit, and the ones in green worked. So you're going to say, well, God, Louise, there's a lot of green. Well, there's more red and blue, actually. Um, the result is only about a third of them were actually green. And most of the green ones cost a lot of money, a lot of money. So there are these surveys, right, of the literature that say, oh, what works best is to throw everything at them. Well, you want to know how much that costs? 1,500, 2,000, 2,500 a participant. There's a program that everybody loves in South Africa called Harambe. Do you know how much that costs? 10,000 a participant. I'm just trying to think how many businesses could use that money and create employment, you know. But anyway, uh, these are very expensive programs. That's what I have to say. Um, now, we're not surprised by Kenya ICT. That's okay. But Liberia has a per capita income of about $500. And that program cost $1,500 a participant. That just doesn't seem like uh, scalable, even though it's used. And how many of these programs look for displacement? Zero. Actually, there's one that looked for displacement. Do I have the Uganda one up here? Uh, I think it came in late. This is the Uganda one that was done at uh, University College London. And they had success. And the earnings of the people, of the participants, were greater than the control group by 17% or something. There was, but however, they randomized the firms that got the people who got the training. And it was 100% displacement. 100% displacement. OK, that's a one that actually looked for it. Um, in France, there was a program that um, helped, uh, that provided like counseling. Here's how to get a job. Here's how to write a resume. Blah, blah, blah. OK, so they did it more intensively in some areas, less intensively in other areas. Again, they found displacement. Where they did it more intensively, um, the results were poor. Where they did it less intensively, those few people who got that, they got jobs. Great, far out. Um, OK, let me just move through, because I'm running out of time. I did what most people don't do. I tried to look at how you can create more jobs in firms. What intervention should you do? Now, this only looks at existing firms. There's, and it doesn't look at youth. Because almost nobody does an intervention in a firm to get them to hire more youth. They just. Actually, most people who do interventions in firms don't even look and see if they expanded employment. But the ones that do didn't ask whether they were young or not. But since it's an employment problem, that's fine. Now, I guess what I really want to focus on is if you really want to get firms to hire more people, you should work with larger firms because they're more likely to um, be able to expand and to be able to, um, to expand employment in a greater way. Um, so if you give larger loans to larger firms, it works. If you give small loans to microenterprises, it doesn't. Um, like, you know, if you give 50K to firms in Nigeria, it works. If you give $200 to firms in Uganda, it doesn't. Maybe there's something in between that works, but that's kind of uh, lays it out. And then one of the things I think, uh, and by the way, all this formalization, uh, this is kind of nutty, forget that. And then, um, but tax simplification does help, although these are fairly weak studies, not very experimental. Um, there's more evidence since I did this on electricity access, by the way. The Center for Global Development has some. Um, and I guess what I would like to say is that um, also 
it's clear from the work of Van Rienen and other people with, associated with the IGC that management matters a lot. And that you can actually, if you can improve management in large firms, you can actually increase employment. And that's something nobody's talking about for their youth employment policy. Why not? I don't know. Um, OK, the, now I'm going to talk about um, household enterprises, startup. And I'm only talking about startup. I'm not talking about increasing earning. Why am I talking about household enterprise startup? That's the youth problem. Youth need to start them. They need to become one of Danielle's people. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, we, well, never mind. Um, I'm not dealing with agriculture here. Why am I not dealing with agriculture? Because nobody does programs. And if they do them, they don't do an experimental evaluation. Almost, like, of, I looked at hundred, uh, oh, almost 200 programs and two, two actually dealt with rural areas. One was Chris Blattman's one for ex-combatants in Liberia teaching them agricultural skills. It worked, by the way. Uh, I think it's up here. Um, now, I combine these supply and demand because it's kind of difficult, especially when they combine. But basically, skills don't, the main thing is skills don't work very well. Finance works better um, for startup. Microfinance actually works for startups. Uh, it doesn't help you expand, though, but it does at least uh, work for startups. Um, you know, there's, a ch there's some cheap programs. You've gone to Educate and you've gone to Brock Ella. These are cheap programs. This one is less than $100 a participant, and it works pretty well. Ah, that tells you something. It's an after-school program. It teaches. It teaches young women the things that they should have learned in school, but never mind. And it also teaches them things like negotiation. Um, I think uh, soft skills comes out. Everybody, everybody thinks, oh my god, youth, we got to get them a job. OK, we better focus on, uh, on TVET, OK? Well, huh. Um, actually, it's, there have been several studies now that seem to suggest soft skills are much more important. And that's what's coming out of this whole thing if you don't want to be replaced by a robot. OK, I got to run through this pretty quickly because I'm out of time. Does gender matter? Yes, uh, but it's complicated. Um, OK, uh, implications. I think we need more research on how you succeed. Uh, in addition to more research on how to create jobs. Uh, and what are the pathways and the bumps in the road? Who influences their thinking on economic opportunities so they know where to look and, the, and, and they know they're going to be in the informal sector anyway? Um, and so, it's, so we've got to increase the earnings. I think rural areas needs work. Um, I, I think we need to look at the real skill constraints. Everybody says, well, if we train them, the firms will come. And if we don't train, the firms won't come. Oh, my goodness. Um, yeah, maybe we should try digital platforms, TaskRabbit, whatever. Um, a lot of people are down on the gig economy, but something's maybe better than nothing. Um, we need to stop thinking that supply creates its own demand. So I'm going to end with this quote by Lindsay Wallace from the MasterCard Foundation based on their own qualitative uh, research uh, in Africa on uh, what works. Having said that, um, the MasterCard Foundation, because of their mandate, is still focused on supply side, but they're trying to at least focus on areas where, where there are jobs. And, um, and I think I'll end with that. OK, thank you very much. Youth. There's youth. Actually, I like the quote. I think I'll leave that up. <laughs>